We're here at Blessed Time of Brewing Company in Townsend, North Texas. We're invited yet again to another brewery for an uh, interview, so let's go outside and see what's going on. So, here's... Hey guys, what's going on? And welcome to a very, very special episode of Geeking and Drinking. I'm your host, Eddie. Steven. And I'm Matt. And we're sitting down with president and co-founder, uh, Mike DeChico. Hey, everybody. Uh, we, uh, we're invited here today to, you know, uh, visit, the, visit the brewery, visit the tap room. And we got some very exciting stuff to talk, to talk about. Um, uh, how's everybody's day going? Everybody going, doing good today? Yeah, everything's going good today. Just very excited to be here. Uh, sit down with Mike, discuss some beer stuff. You know? Yep. Great uh, way to be, wind down on pretty, a Friday, It's going right? to be a pretty good episode. I'm honestly just getting over a hangover I had this morning, so <laughs> you know, right. time to get another one. Yeah, time to get another one. A little <laughs> hair of the dog. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, yeah, uh, we are here in Busta Sando uh, in San Antonio, Texas. Um, and uh, we actually located on the north, which say northwest side of San Antonio, more or less, kind of a uh, 410, I-10. <clears throat> Uh, Fredericksburg, in that general area. Um, uh, if you've been here, it's a wonderful place. And if you haven't, I highly suggest you you know come check it out. They have you know some awesome beers. Uh, I'm pretty sure the beers you've seen in the stores, you know, at bars, you know, in your area, uh, they're you know they're around. So I mean, like I said, if you haven't checked them out, check them out. They have a delicious IPA. Their 210L and their porter is is fantastic. Um, but yeah, thanks, Mike, for having us today. Um, you know, like I said, we you know we're, we're really excited when we do these do these you know, visits and you know, get to know the people behind the beer. So uh, I mean, thanks for, for having us. Absolutely, welcome, guys. Really appreciate you coming out today. Um, so. One thing that we always like to ask uh, our, you know, on these visits, you know, is to, to get a little uh, backstory on, you know, you and, you know, I guess you, and, and your journey to, you know, you know, to all this. So, absolutely. I mean. Absolutely. Uh, well, uh, my journey in the craft beer kind of started uh, when I came to Texas uh, in the early 90s. I joined the Air Force and uh, was stationed here in Texas. Uh, here in San Antonio for four years. Uh, originally um, born and raised in uh, California, uh, but happy to say I'm a Texan now for almost uh, 25 years now or so. <laughs> so I'm uh, definitely more Texan than Californian. Uh, and uh, It's consumed you. <laughs> it has, it really has. It's definitely more home to me than home. So uh, I can say that um, uh, discovering Shinerbach uh, in my early 20s was really nice. Uh, of course, growing up in um, California, we had Sierra Nevada. We had a lot of exposure to some early Colorado regional beers. Uh, so craft beer wasn't really super new to me, but it was nice to discover Shinerbach in those right. uh, in those times. And um, and. Over time, um, just being a consumer, um, I had an opportunity uh, probably in the mid to late 90s. I, I started home brewing uh, in 1998, but I had a really good mentor that was a, a friend of mine in the Air Force, and he had been home brewing for about 10 years. Uh, so. Uh, I'll, I'll never forget. His name was Chicky LeClaire. Chicky LeClaire. <laughs> he wow. sounds like a brewer. How can you yeah, forget yeah, that yeah. name, right? <laughs> so Chicky taught me and several others how to homebrew. We used to hang out uh, on the patio. And I was always too afraid to do it on my own. But when I became a fan of drinking, uh, especially when Blue Star opened uh, uh, down on the south side of San Antonio, south, down, south town, mm -hmm. um, we basically uh, really just hung, latched on to Blue Star. And to be honest with you, I never missed a first Friday uh, at Blue Star for about four or five years running. Wow. Um, I even had a wedding reception there. <laughs> so I was that, that much into craft beer. Uh, I know Joey and Maggie pretty well um, over the years. And um, uh, 
Uh, over time, uh, my friend Robert and I, we just, uh, our palates were thirsting for more. Yeah. And uh, we used to go to Austin to, to drink beer at a few places that are our faves. Uh, uh, back then, uh, our faves were uh, the Copper Tank, a place called the Bitter End, and uh, a brewery called the Waterloo uh, Brewing Company. Um, <clears throat> none of them exist today. Uh, but those were our three main stops. Um, and uh, basically, uh, we would go to Austin to kind of find some different unique craft beers. Right. And we decided to start home brewing. And so uh, for 21 years now, I've been uh, involved in brewing in some aspect or another, learning how to home brew in 1998. So uh, this year's... Uh, you know, embarking on my 21st year right. in doing that. Um, so uh, fast forward uh, 15 years or so after that, uh, I had an opportunity to, uh, uh, to start something new in my life. Um, uh, I was, you know, in a, in a point in my life where I had a lot of equity in my home, I was uh, no children, I was divorced, uh, and uh, Robert kind of came to me with an opportunity to, uh, he had overheard somebody talking at one of the local homebrew supply shops. Oh, okay. And um, they had 200 pounds of grain, and they were ordering hops to do some brewing. He's like, who has, like, this is the, the homebrew store. Yeah. That, that much green what are you what are you doing and evidently there was a falling out at uh, a potential small brewery in, that could have came around in Southtown um, and uh, he got the guy's information and uh, we went and talked to him the very next day and uh, we we talked to him about being becoming partners and he yeah. didn't want anything to do with it because <laughs> him and a partner had just kind of dissolved oh, okay. over a dispute of having a 10 gallon brew system in their little brewery or a, or a one barrel system and uh, the amount of money that they might be generating right. and stuff like that. So uh, came back to, uh, to work and uh, basically he pitched me on this idea of, uh, hey man, check out this book, How to Start a Nano Brewery. <laughs> and it, it was free that week on uh, Kindle. So I read it over the weekend, came back to work on Monday, and I told him, I said, hey, I'm starting a nano brewery. Let's do this. <laughs> Let's do it. And he didn't believe me until we really sat down at lunch that day and started putting figures down on napkins and yeah. trying to figure it out. Um, and it kind of grew from there. And it, the idea kind of got a little bigger than a nano brewery. <laughs> But not much bigger. We right. we found a sweet spot that we we still feel comfortable in to this day, um, and we've been up and running for five and a half years now. So that's awesome. Um, jumping back, you know, you, you know, back when you were you know homebrewing, what was the first beer you homebrewed? Like what type of beer? It was a pale ale. Pale ale. Yep, very popular uh, at that time, um, and something that we did with a all uh, extract brew. Um, Definitely were timid uh, as far as starting off and trying to learn how to brew with all grain batches. Um, and I really, really regret that because <laughs> the day we switched to all grain was the day we started thinking, oh, my goodness, this is this is almost store-bought quality, um, you know, at that point in time. Yeah. Um, but, yeah, it was a pale ale, and then it was a Hefeweizen, and okay. then a Stout. Mm -hmm. And lucky for us, the beers tasted good. Otherwise, we probably would have stopped <laughs> yeah. making them, right? Yeah, you would have been, you would have been uh, real discouraged and just yeah. like, eh. <laughs> And that happens, right? Oh, yeah, People try to brew, yeah. and they fail to launch in some aspect, and they're like, ah, oh, it's just so much better to, I'll just keep buying I'll it. Just do, yeah. I'll just buy it. i just give them my money. Here you go. <laughs> and I mean, I'm not going to lie. I, I kind of, like, I, when we first started doing this, you know, I would listen back to episodes, I'm just like, ugh. <sighs> It's like maybe we, should, we should just stop. I just watch po other podcasts, you know. But <laughs> but the thing is, you gotta keep going. You know, you fail the first time, you you know you keep giving it a shot. And I mean, look what it got you. You know, you good thing. You know, you you know. He said, thankfully, you had good beer. Um, are any? I mean, I know it's probably a long shot, but I mean, are any of those like um, 
techniques or whatever you, uh, you use back in the day for those, you know, for your first kind of batches. Do you still you can use that today or is it t- it's totally different, you know, now? Well, um, I don't think it's any different than any home brewer would have experienced, right? Yeah. really, right? So it's not like we somehow invented the brew-in-a-bag brew technique or something unique. Um, but to this day, our brewery is still very uh, hands-on. Mm-hmm. Uh, we still mix our mash by hand, um, kind of like you would do in a, in a homebrew system, just scaled up. <clears throat> Um, so we're, we're mixing with a, with a giant mash paddle, a shovel, uh, we're, uh, transferring our liquids from one tank to another manually, um, much like you would do in a homebrew, uh, just scaled up. Mm -hmm. So there's not, no automation, uh, no magic buttons here. Um, so we do, uh, at some level we take some pride in that, um, and at another level, we, we want to graduate to a, a larger uh, brew system than that you right. know, someday. Uh, but we're, we're really happy with, with where we are today. So. And that's awesome. I mean, and well, you should be because, like, I mean, uh, Buzz Sando is one of, those, one of those breweries that, and, uh, you know, I mentioned this before, that we, you know, I see it everywhere. I mean, I go to an HEB, you know, that, that doesn't have a, a huge, you know, craft the, beer the selection. The movie theater, you go to the movie yeah, theater, go to the movie theater you know, and they have one. Busted Sandal there. And it's just if like. It's not, uh, if it's not the 210, it's the, uh, slippery, rock. the slippery Rock or the uh, the Porter. The, yeah, uh, or Busto. Busto. Mm-hmm. So. Uh, you know, so, I mean, you're out there, and I, and I think that's awesome. Um, and so, obviously, I mean, you're a Slippery Rock and you're 210, or, you know, would you call those your flagship beers, your, your main beers? Yep, so definitely Slippery Rock is the yeah. fly, flagship beer. Uh, it's designed to be an approachable IPA. Mm-hmm. Uh, there are a lot of uh, craft beer drinkers that would say, oh, it's just not bitter enough for my palate. Uh, but it's designed that way because San Antonio, uh, we feel, is in a transitional state. Uh, right. mm-hmm. They... There are craft beer drinkers that, that are kind of new to craft beer, mm-hmm. and we don't want them to have their first taste be that bitter beer face. Yeah. And I'm going to go back to my Bud Light um, or Dos Equis. You yeah. know? Um, <clears throat> so uh, it's, it's meant to be a, uh, a, a, an approachable IPA that's not going to be off-putting to the palate. Uh, it's got the hops. We use a, a wide variety of hops in that beer mm-hmm. um but completely designed to be a low ibu mm-hmm. uh ipa okay. yeah i guess i can agree with that because uh i love my craft beer i love craft beer but um as far as uh ipas go it's it's real hard for me to, to uh drink an ipa sometimes and uh, i tasted the slippery rock and i was like oh you know i this is doable for me. I can, yeah. I can actually enjoy this one a little bit more. Yeah. I don't, I'm not like babysitting it all night. <laughs> yeah. There's hops in there, but you know, they're, they're not, they're not. And it's still got a real good taste. Hitting it hard. Yeah. Yeah. So. Yeah. But uh, I could enjoy an IPA any day. At any yeah. Time. Whether it's bitter, not bitter. That's one of the first craft beers I was interested, well, I was introduced to was IPA. And I was like, at me being that first one to be introduced to that, not drinking much, it's, I don't know why I've, I, I grown to love him so. Yeah, and uh, thing is like, and you know, for me, whenever I see Busted Sando, I mean, and first time I saw it, I was like, oh, this is brewery from San Antonio. I was like, oh, okay, that's cool, you know. Um, and the thing always kind of stuck out to me. I mean, and it just that's just for me is the name. And can you touch on about like, like where that came from? Or was it just like a, you yeah. know, this kind of opening? Where did that name come from? Absolutely. So. Um, Probably in the beginning, uh, I was talking a little bit about our trips to Austin, right? right. And seeking out some craft beer in the, the late 90s in our favorite places. Mm-hmm. Well, one of the great things about Waterloo Brewing Company is uh, they had a homebrew supply shop that they also ran adjacent to the brewery. So you could go in, put in your, your order for your ingredients, mm-hmm. and go hang out, throw some darts, drink some great beers that they had. Uh, and then when you went to leave, you can go over there and pick them up. Well, uh, one day after a day of beer drinking in Austin, you know, that, that's our last stop, getting our, our homebrew kit. Mm-hmm. And uh, we come across a flattened out sandal in the middle of the road. Uh, now, I don't know about you, but after a day of beer drinking, you know, stories are like, how did this thing get here? What's the backstory behind this thing? 
Uh, I hope someone didn't get hit by a car. <laughs> but, you know, normally when, uh, because in South Texas, we, we like to say, you know, we wear sandals 10 months out of the year in South Texas. Mm-hmm. We have warm climate. Yeah. Uh, we just uh, like to say that uh, usually if you bust a sandal, there's, a, there's some kind of story. You're horsing around. Uh, you're having fun. Something happens. You bust a sandal. And we like to say it's kind of the sign of a good time. Right. Well, we, we sure hope that that was a good time for whoever was wearing yeah. that sandal. <laughs> yeah. uh, but uh, it was really hilarious to come across. Um, and when it came time to name the brewery, you know, flash, you know, fast forward like 15 years after that, uh, we literally had a list of 60 brewery names. And myself, Robert, and Joe, uh, the three original guys that decided to get together and found the brewery, mm-hmm. uh, we went through rounds of elimination. Uh, instead of rounds of voting for the ones that were our favorites, we said, okay, uh, let's go through and, and eliminate three. Let's eliminate three. And so it stayed on the list. Uh, and as we got closer and closer to the bottom, I think we all kind of knew that we were heading towards Busted Sandal. <laughs> That's awesome. So, do, you, uh, do you happen to remember uh, any of the other na- potential awesome. names? Or I think like a few of them. Potential yeah, names. yeah. <laughs> so um, in the beginning, we really wanted to take a stance of being a, a, a green energy brewery. Mm-hmm. And so we had ideas you know how when you're going through west texas and you see the uh the, the, the wind farms yeah, 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 right yes. and so those wind those big windmills are always have three points on them right so we were going to go with something like three points brewing okay. and make sure that of course we bought all of our energy from cps using wind wind energy credits mm-hmm. were new at the time uh six years ago um so we were going to purchase um our electricity, you can pay a little extra to uh, purchase uh, wind energy credits. So essentially, you're helping fund that that uh, wind energy in West Texas. Um, we also had ideas of um, like the whole solar panels, and um, so a lot of them were kind of geared toward that. So if you can, if you can kind of think of different types of names that were geared around green energy they were right. they were that way but we started thinking this could be a fad right this could be something where oh yeah that's what you're saying we're 10 years old and and the the little the little kid that just graduated MIT at 11 years old really comes up with fusion that works yeah. or something and we're like oh you know our brewery's going to be named after something that was popular at the time yeah and so we just decided to kind of fall back and focus on something that was more direct, you okay. know, the busted sandal. It has a nice ring to it. At one point, we even joked that it sounded like a good alt rock band name, yeah. you know, busted sandal. <laughs> busted sandal. You know, it's an and coming to the We're stage, busted sandal. Busted sandal. Yeah. <laughs> you know, something that rings uh, true and and makes a connection with people. You know, so. well, I mean, you hit the you, you mean you hit the nail on the head with that name. I, I said, I mean, that's. Like, so for me, it's that's a name that's always stuck out to me, and it's just like you know, I was like, I see him like, yeah, that's that's San Antonio, that's Texas, that's mm-hmm. you know, that's, yeah, and that's it, make, awesome. it makes it makes perfect sense, you know, like you said, being South Texas, growing up in South Texas, you're in flip flops or sandals ten months out of the out of the year, you know. Yeah, and when we found the location, of course, you know, we could have done something like Oak Hills Brewing <coughs> Company yeah. or something that we were close to, or found the nearest creek or river yeah. mm-hmm. or something, but. We instead of because you have to imagine, and especially in the 2000s and 90s, like geographic things were in, were a lot, of, and still to this day, really people kind of stake their claim on their where they're where they're located. Like uh, it could be the town name, or it could be a stream or a river or or something, you know. And even in town in San Antonio, we have breweries kind of named that way. So yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, some for some of the most part, some of the breweries in town are just kind of straightforward. Mm. You know, just, you know, obviously you kind of get where the name came from. But, yeah, we were pretty curious about where, where did Busted Sandal come from? Where, mm-hmm. How did that come about? But yeah. thanks for answering that for us. It's, uh, that was, it's actually a really good, unique story. And, I mean, it's, it seems like a fun story, too, because, like you say, you just, Austin, see this Busted Sandal on the ground. Like, hey, what's yeah. the backstory to that? Yeah. yeah, and it takes us back to our roots of beer drinking, too. 
you know, you have to imagine and go back in time to the late 90s. Yeah. You know, you had Blue Star and there was Yellow Rose Brewing Company and Frio. Um, there, yeah, weren't, there, Frio. Weren't, there weren't very many options for local beer. Hmm. Uh, so uh, if you didn't make it at home, you had to go to Austin. I mean, that's kind of... So, I mean, that's kind of what we did. That's kind of so like... That was kind of like, day the, out like of the thing for everything back in the day. It was like, if you can't find it here, you got to go to Austin. you got to go yeah. a little bit up north, you know? Which, yeah. it's not too bad, because Austin's not too far from us. But mm-hmm. sometimes you wish it, it's just a little closer to home. So, yeah. So, so um, two hours. What year was the... Uh, I mean, was the brewery actually up and running, you know, like starting up and, you know, running? Our first production batch of beer was August 2013. Okay, so at that time, um, I mean, obviously the craft beer, you know, uh, industry in general here in San Antonio has, you know, it, it's it's growing and it's still growing to this day. Um, at that time, did you find it difficult to, you know, I mean, like, I guess, see any, uh, you know, um, any uh, recognition, you know, as far as like people trying your beer, or, you know, or it was, you know, what was, the, I guess, what I'm trying to say, like, what, what was the hardest, you know, kind of challenge you faced at that time? Um. Well, I think market uh, coming coming to market and being competitive uh, with other breweries uh, is always a nail biter for a new brewery. Right. You're wondering how's that first batch or two or three going to be received. And uh, lucky for us, we started with the porter, uh, which was immediately embraced. Okay. Uh, I really, really am glad we went that that route because it allowed us to kind of dial in our systems and get used to brewing on a bigger scale. Um, I think if we would have went with a lighter beer, um, any type of uh, uh, intricacies that were not, we weren't hitting the, the notes just right on, they would have been more prominent okay. than if we wouldn't have done the started with the porter. Okay. Um, and, uh, you know, I would say kind of just in general uh, things getting started and difficulties. Uh, we, we are very non-traditional in one major aspect. Uh, when we got started, there was this uh, idea that when you started a craft brewery, you had to self-distribute your beer. Mm-hmm. And you had to build up the number of taps and placements that you had in the market. And then you would approach a distribution company to purchase your presence in the market uh, from you and negotiate that. Because essentially you're, you're going to them and saying, hey, we're going to be business partners moving forward. And a percentage of all of these taps, uh, we're, we're kind of handing them over to you. Yeah. And here's our track record, right? Well, uh, that was just the status quo. We didn't do that. So uh, basically, we um, very uniquely, we signed a distribution agreement before we even opened. Hmm. Um, we were told that we would not make it financially we were not gonna start off a business that way and immediately that percentage of margin going with a distrib with a distribution partner would be making it very difficult for us Mm -hmm. Um, but it worked out great because as you said in the beginning when you go around san antonio our market presence is high yeah Okay, so lucky for us, we have a great business relationship with our with our uh, distribution partner in San Antonio, and they've really, uh, to give them credit, have really elevated our brand to where we are today. Yeah. So. So I mean, I guess. Um, I mean, I guess that that uh, you know that's that's awesome in itself, you know, because I mean, you know, you have to have that good relationship, you know, to get your beer out there. I mean, it's it, you know. You, yeah, you make a good beer, you know, but you have to you get it out there, you know. And you know, like I said, like mm-hmm. I guess said many times, you guys are out there. So, I mean, that's I mean, I I, I just love to see that. You know, I go to a store, and there's you know, a couple of crap beers, and oh, there's Buster Sandal. You know, awesome. You know, like I'm, you know, I, I love to see that. Uh, so we're gonna take a little break. Um, mm-hmm. You know, get some refills, and uh, we'll come back and continue the interview. Cool. Sounds great. All right.
Hey guys, and we're back. Uh, we got our refills. Uh, we used the restroom. Uh, Thanks for telling our secrets. Yeah. Oh yeah. man. Hey man, you know you gotta. You know we drink beer. Nature and, call. Yeah, yeah. You, you drink beer, and you know what happens. You use mm-hmm. the restroom, you can't stop going. Uh, but yes, yeah, so we're sitting down with uh, Mike from Busted Sando. Uh, you know, he just finished giving us a little bit of insight on his journey to, you know, to uh, to home, back from home brewing. You know, to having uh, this amazing brewery. Um, to uh, having, uh, yeah, like you said, having this amazing brewery, uh, five years and running, right? Yep. August will be our six-year anniversary this year. Nice. That's very nice. Um, so, with that being said, I mean, you're, you know, you know uh, coming up on your sixth year. Um, we, uh, you know, we, we know that, you know, we've, y'all been doing some uh, renovations to your tap room, as, you know, and expanding it. Um, you know, uh, I come in here, and it's a real in, in, intimate setting, you know, it, uh, you come in, you have a couple of drinks, you know, and, you know, it's, it's, uh, you say it's real intimate, you know, uh, but, you know, now you're expanding the tap room, have a, have a larger uh, bar, you know, uh, you know, and, um, uh, we, uh, you know, we see you guys actually putting in that work, you know, like, you know, we, you know, People, you know, most people hire someone to do this stuff, um, but not you guys. You know, we, we came <laughs> in yesterday, and you, know, you guys were well, hard at it. You know, you know, painting. Yeah. You know, and that, like, and that I, I deeply admire. You know, it's, you know, it's just because, I mean, it shows that you, you know you put in your your um, you know your blood, sweat, and tears into this thing, and you know, and it, it looks Absolutely. amazing. And I can't wait to see the you know to see when it's open and everything. Um, what I mean, you know, like. Why now? I mean, how, why not two years ago? Why not? You know, I mean, what what would persuade you to be like? Let's let's do let's uh let's expand this thing and let's, mm-hmm. let's do it ourselves. Great, great question. So, um, when we started our business, uh, we had a brewery permit in Texas, and uh, mm-hmm. breweries could not sell beer to go, mm-hmm. and today, still cannot sell beer to go. And the demand from the customer was to be able to sell beer to go. Um, so the age-old compromise, matter of fact, when, when we opened, you couldn't even sell beer to the customer in your tap room. You had to sample it, correct? You could sample it for free. But the age-old workaround was you would sell a tour and give people three samples or something as part of that tour, right? Yeah. So it was built into the tour uh, fee, but uh, nice, nice enough for the laws to have changed where it made it a little more above board where we can legitimately sell beer to a customer on premise, whether you're a brewery or a brew pub, which is great. Uh, we eventually traded in and surrendered our brewery permit and got a brew pub permit. Mm-hmm. Uh, so that we could sell beer to go. So with, the, with the brew pub permit, it still allows you to brew, to brew the beer on premises and you know, to operate as a brewery. But now you could sell beer, uh, you know, to go, mm. growlers, growlers, all that Correct. stuff. Yes, because the theoretical maximum of us producing, um, you know, the, the, the maximum amount we could not hit in this facility anyway. Mm-hmm. So uh, the nice part of that is we can operate um, at the brew pub level, still distribute our beer, still serve to our customers in the tap room, and now sell beer to go. Um, from what I understand, we've got some uh, pending legislation. We're mm-hmm. going to hopefully see breweries be able to sell beer to go. And maybe one day we'll change back to being a brewery because that's what we are. Yeah. But we changed to being brew pub permit so that we could do the business model we wanted. And that takes us back to your question about the tap room. Why now after all this time, yeah. right? So as businesses in the, in the brewing industry developed, um, I'm sure you've seen how on-premise business at breweries is now... Um, getting hotter and hotter. So when you go to visit a brewery, you expect to get served on premise, maybe be able to buy something to go, a bottle to go, yeah. right? Um, you're going to probably see food yeah, at mm-hmm. 50% of them or more. Um, and it's going to be a, an experience, yeah, right? For sure. And we were lucky enough to have the tenant next to us 
uh, move to another suite. <laughs> and as soon as that happened, we signed the lease, <laughs> right? <laughs> But we weren't ready to expand at that point two or two years ago. Just yeah. wanted to but have we, that. Spot we gobbled left. it up real quick. Yeah. And true to fashion, like you mentioned, like we started knocking things down ourselves, and we had a roll-off dumpster, and we were doing the demolition ourselves. Uh, and anything, we've always been that way. If it, if something can be done um, with our own hands, we're going to try to do it. Yeah. Um, if it needs to be permitted. Uh, by the city and an electrician needs to do it and it has to be signed off on mm -hmm. that type of thing of course we hire it out because that's required yeah right, like but, plumbing and stuff like that yeah yeah but there's a lot of little things you can do you can build your own bar you can drill your own taps mm -hmm. you can like you said you can paint you can stain you can do things and that's what you'll always see us doing because i feel that the passion is there that we care a lot about what we do whether we're making the beer or whether we're staining the wood for our tap room, but right. we're going to put it in there and there's going to be a story about it. Right. Yeah. Um, and, and that's what we're hoping to bring with our new tap room. It's bigger, more seating. We're going to actually have a large seating area compared to what we used to have. Yeah. We are going to start offering light food. Uh, we're going to have many more taps We're 39 <laughs> taps on the wall. Uh, we are going to start off with 19. And they will be all busted sandal beers because we're distributing. We're yeah. not going to have yes. guest taps. Um, but we are going to be having a lot more fun on our small brew system mm -hmm. and really creating some off-the-wall beers that we haven't really had the space on our tap wall to even play with that all, all that yeah. much. We do every now and then, but now we're going to have so much room, it's going to be ingrained into what we do. What um, So... Got the tap room coming up. That's gonna be that's one future thing coming up here at Busted Sando in the in y'all's tap room. Mm -hmm. What about any, any new brews? Any new type of beers you're gonna be distributing pretty soon, or that you're gonna be adding on when the tap room opens? Well, the, great question. So uh, we do have a pretty good variety of seasonals and rotating beers that we do each year, annual beers. Mm -hmm. um, but we are encouraging our staff to produce more fun beers that we haven't had the room to even do. We're also going to start a barrel aging program, okay. uh, which we haven't had room to do. Yeah. And now that we have a large climate controlled area, we're going to be stacking barrels in there also uh, on one of the walls. And it's going to be a nice ambiance kind of thing, but we'll also be functional, right? So yeah. it'll be kept at a nice temp and uh, aging some of, some of our beers in there. Um, I don't want to let the cat out of the bag too much, but we okay. do we do have a, a fun beer coming up. Our new assistant brewer, uh, her name's Angelica. Uh, she has a, a personal recipe she's gonna be bringing to the table soon, and it's it's like a very pungent uh, hibiscus beer. Okay. okay. So uh, we've started nice. to see some kind of glowing red and purple type beers hitting the market. Mm -hmm. uh, this is something she's had up her sleeve for a while, um, and I can tell you that it is, from what I saw when it was being brewed, the darkest red beer I've ever seen. <laughs> <laughs> and I'll leave it at that because I don't want to take the surprise away of right. what it yeah, yeah, of what it really <laughs> looked. It's it's going to be phenomenal. It's uh, a sneak peek. <laughs> it's a, it really is. Uh, we're really looking forward to that. I'm sure it's done fermenting by now because this was about two or three weeks ago. Uh, so we're looking for it soon. Um, right now, this time of year, we're releasing our uh, Fire Pit Wit, which is our Belgian wit beer uh, with ginger root and grapefruit and uh, orange peel, coriander. Um, and then on top of that, we do our Tan Lines Pale Ale. And every year we pick a unique hop for tan lines mm -hmm. and uh, this year we've, we've picked a unique one i think it's uh azaka wow. azaka azaka mm -hmm. okay. yeah <laughs> it's a tropical <laughs> citrus hop and it'll be single hopped okay so. cool okay. cool awesome. yeah. uh, that's interesting i kind of like the, some of the citrusy stuff so yeah i can't wait to, to the last year was bavarian mandarina okay so this year is a little different <laughs> um, so, uh, with the new tap room, um, 
you know, it, it, in, in, in it being the, the month of April that we're in, in San Antonio, that means one thing, it's fiesta. Yes. Like everybody loves a fiesta. Our city loves their, their, their party. Yep. Um, <laughs> and with fiesta, you know, it comes to fiesta medals. Yes. And uh, I uh, understand that you guys are have your fiesta medals uh, coming out real soon, and you know will be available to purchase here at the brewery. Yep. So every year, this is our sixth year, uh, as we mentioned. Uh, so if you had a flight of them going, they're all numbered by their years uh, with with the date stamp on them. Uh, so this is our sixth fiesta medal party. Uh, we do luchador wrestling. We do conjunto music. We do. Uh, some unique beers uh and we have some unique things going on yeah. uh at this party coming up as well yeah awesome, awesome. i gotta i gotta look at the i, I gotta i gotta look at the meadow and i love it it says on there uh viva la chancla <laughs> yes <laughs> viva la chancla yep that's been our theme for a couple years running and it's really been uh really popular at fiesta time that's cool, man. Mm-hmm. Uh, I mean, like I said, I, I, you know, I deeply admire the fact that, you know, you guys are putting in the work yourselves. You know, you're, you know, like I said, we came here, so you guys were, you know, we're, you know, we're painting. You guys were, you know, we're, uh, uh, we're busting each other's balls, you know, <laughs> it's all good, you know. And, um, you know, obviously there are days, you know, where, you know, things run smooth. Have there been hectic days where you guys are just like at each other's throats or, you know, yeah. just kind of disagree on things? I mean, I mean, you guys are all friends, you know, yes. and, you know, but... You know, I mean, us brothers, there are days where we know we're just like, oh, <laughs> you know, like. yes, uh, sometimes it's in the work and yeah. sometimes it's in in the beer um, uh, on the construction side. Oh, man, if you could even imagine there's three opinions on the way to do something the best. Right. <laughs> so yes. you can be sleeves rolled up knee deep into something and someone's like. Well, you should have done it this other way. And then, like you said, you know, we all start, you know, ribbing each other and like, hey, man, where were you 20 minutes ago when I started doing this thing? Right. Uh, On the beer side, uh, you know, things happen in a brewery. Uh, We just had an equipment failure uh, Uh about three weeks ago. And what happened was we were pressurizing a tank uh, to carbonate. Uh, some of our hop dong IPA mm-hmm. and uh, the sight glass uh, actually slipped off of the valve Uh-oh. but no one was in the room so it was like a sprinkler for who knows how long <laughs> of three or four hundred gallons of beer being sprayed around the room Oh no! <laughs> and uh, it was really devastating to the team yeah. It was de- devastating to the customers waiting for it. Yeah, uh, we were we were lucky enough to salvage about two barrels of beer out of that tank, and carbonated up, and we we have some on the wall today. Um, but we've immediately brewed another batch, so it's fermenting right now. <laughs> nice, uh, nice. But I can tell you that uh, you know sometimes things happen, and it could be, you know. Whether it's construction or beer making, yeah, we, you know, like you said, you got to roll with it, and uh, we make the best out of it. That's, so. I mean, that's all you can do. I mean, and that's, like I said, something I deeply admire. You know, running a brewery with your friends. You know, and you know, like I said we got to talk to Rob and Kevin yesterday, and the awesome yeah. guys. Um, so I understand that you also, you know, but you know, you have the tap room coming up. You have the medals. Um, you also have a. Uh, would, you, would you call it an exclusive kind of a club uh, in that of the 100 club? Can you yes. put, give us some insight on that and you know what it comes you know being a member of that? Yes, absolutely. Um, so glad you brought that up. So we're starting a new club. Uh, as soon as we open the new tap room, we'll be uh, taking on members, and it's really going to be limited to 100. Uh, so we start. We've called it the 100 club. Uh, the 100 Club allows uh, a, a member to have a custom 20-ounce glass. Mm-hmm. Uh, With their name on it, correct? Well, the, it, well, won't, well. it won't have their name on it, but they'll have a cubby to keep it in that's got their name engraved okay, okay. On, oh, okay. on the that's, cubby. So it's kind of kind of like a being in preschool, but for adults. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> you know, here's your glass. It goes right here. Yep. Yeah. And so uh, it's an annual uh, membership. And for, for your membership in the club, you get to pick 
at what level you want to participate. We'll have three different levels. Oh, cool. And the, the initial level um, gets you uh, fills of that 20 ounce glass for $3, right, uh, on the wall. You're able to bring guests in and they're able to get discounted beers, discounted merchandise when you come, discounted uh, access to our events and things like that. And as you work your way up, you get more and more perks. Uh, so uh, the, the second and third tiers involve a new bottle program that we're going to start. So we're going to be doing bottle releases and you're committing to buying a certain number of bottles at each level of your membership. Mm -hmm. So at the second level of membership, you're committing to buying two bottles a quarter. And at the third level, you're committed to buying three bottles per quarter. And when you say bottles, like, uh, can you elaborate on that a little bit? Like like a what, what so very limited release special mm -hmm. beers that you can only get as a member. Mm -hmm. And it's kind of a first come first serve. Uh, members will receive those bottles at 50% of the cost as retail. Now, once the bottles are offered to our members mm -hmm. and in a private party that only members can attend with their uh, significant guests. others, yeah. with their guests, right? Um, there'll be food provided, live music. Uh, It'll be your bottle pickup party, so to speak, right? Mm. Uh, but it'll be every quarter. Um, then at that point in time, you're going to be uh, probably picking up most of the bottles, but there'll be some left over that will be sold at full price okay. Okay. to, the, to the customers. The, the they'll always be 750s. 750s? Mm -hmm. So, uh, you know, about 25, 26 ounces, somewhere in there, right? Basically a wine bottle size Ooh. right but it's got a beer top you know on it um, um, bottle cap so uh, that's going to be new for us it's going to be new to the customers we had some fun with a uh, cherry sour par uh, porter yes. at our porter palooza I, I was here for a porter palooza and that, that was probably one of my favorites uh, next to the um, I forgot what you got called but was the, it the, the tiramisu the, or the pumpkin uh, Oh, El Gordo? El Gordo. <laughs> yes. That one was really good. Yes. Yeah, uh, if you follow Bussano on Instagram, uh, they posted a video of the event, and I believe you were in that video. Yes. Yeah, yeah I'm nice. in the video where uh, Kevin's actually smoking the, uh, the porters. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, that, yeah. That, that was real interesting. I, it, it got a lot of people's attention. They're like, yeah, what is that? That in itself, the smoking of the beer is a very, very... Uh, uh, I was interested, in, and I was just like, wow, you know, like... and. Uh, I believe Kevin was telling me about some stuff he's working on uh, pretty soon, and you know, with the uh, with the with the Mexican lager. So it, it mm -hmm. you know, I, I I'm definitely excited for that. You know, want to check that out. Um, but yeah, so when is the um, the 100 Club going to be launched? It'll be launched when we open the new tap room. Okay. Right now, we've had, so we've passed some final inspections. Mm -hmm. We're on our journey to getting that certificate of occupancy, and that's when we're going to open. Uh, we have passed, I think, three of our five inspections that we have. Mm -hmm. So we're just kind of waiting on fire inspection right now okay. and then framing. Mm -hmm. um, and it could be right around the beginning of May is what it's looking like. Okay. okay. So I don't want to call it Cinco soon. de Mayo, but it could happen. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, do y'all do anything, uh, any kind of events during Cinco de Mayo or just kind of... We haven't, uh, but we are going to be doing one in May this year, and I'm not sure. I, I would have to check the calendar, but it, we are doing a pan dulce pairing. Uh, so uh, one of our big events every year has been a pairing with uh, the cookies mm -hmm. that the little females that sell every year that are really nicely flavored and they'll, <laughs> they'll solicit you to yes. buy them. <laughs> okay, I can't say their name yeah, because yeah, of a letter yeah. from their attorneys. Yes, <laughs> but, but, but I know what you're talking about. Yes, yeah. uh, we've, we've, been, oh, we've actually been uh, served from those folks. But we, <laughs> but we can tell you that uh, we, we legitimately purchase some cookies every year and we pair them with our beers and uh, support our <laughs> troops. Uh, 
what we're going to do is a similar pairing with Pandose. And oh, we did okay, it nice. three years ago. It was wildly mm. successful. Uh, but we haven't done it since. So we're bringing okay. it back this year. Uh, so we'll have about three or four beers with three different types of sweet breads. It's going to be really good. So awesome. Yeah, awesome. And that'll be in May. Okay. And then, uh, like I mentioned earlier, I was here for the uh, Port Palooza. Is that one of y'all's regular uh, events? Is that something that y'all do every year? Yes. So, so I know this year was my first year coming to it. Each year it gets bigger and bigger. Uh, and the number of porters gets bigger and bigger. Mm -hmm. So I think we had nine or ten different porters this year. about ten this year. And each year there's new ideas and and it's usually our 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 uh, customers that suggest these as we're coming up to porter palooza okay. what they want to see in a porter well, if the customers are suggesting i wonder if it was a customer or if it was one of you guys that suggested the uh, el diablo because that one was, that was el diablo it was good, is my <laughs> personal homebrew <laughs> recipe man it, it got me i was like oh was God. it too hot it was just a little too Be spicy, but because but, but, this but is the me, mildest year we've ever made it. <laughs> for me, I, I'm, I'm, when it comes to spices and and like um, sauces and chiles and stuff like that, I'm real I'm real weak with that. So, so don't 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 come, don't go, don't uh, take my suggestions from it. Just, just uh, the like, heat oh, wow. comes from chili pekins that are dried, but there are four different peppers mm -hmm. in that one and. Uh, if we had the ingredient stack in front of you, it would fill up a dinner plate. But we've got piloncillo uh, sugar. We've got um, ancho chilies, pasilla peppers. Uh, we've got uh, chili piquins. And we've got, um, um, I'm missing one, chipotle. Chipotle. Yeah. And then on top of that, we do... Um, uh, lots of spices, right? So comino, cinnamon, uh, nutmeg, uh, allspice, okay. um, a lot of different spices go into it. And it's just kind of a flavor explosion and a, kind of the, trying to capture that mole uh, character. Yeah, I remember that's what um, someone was saying was that it was kind of like if you're a fan of mole, mm -hmm. you know, this is something. El know. Diablo, it's a spicy mole porter, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. uh, in the beginning, it was very hot, and we've had to scale it down. Uh, um, I think I was here the night before the event, yeah, we were and here. Uh, I think uh, we, we got to try the uh, non-carbonated version of it. There you go. <laughs> so, uh, which I was like, okay, I can you know I can tolerate this non-carbonated one. I wonder how it's gonna taste when it is carbonated. And it, <laughs> and it came out. It came out. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. But it was it was good. Um, I mean, no offense, though, it, it was probably like my fourth favorite of the porters of, of the ten porters. Yeah. Uh, like I said, the cherry was was like my top favorite. The pumpkin, the leche, and then the El Diablo. Yeah, the dulce de leche was my favorite. Yeah, yeah. And that one was really good when again when Kevin did the smoke, and that one he actually put a little piece of cinnamon in it. Yeah, cinnamon so, stick. Yeah, right? cinnamon stick. So you know, yeah, it, yeah. It, it brought it brought an, an extra flavor to it. So that was that was real good. That was real interesting. So yeah, um, I hope you guys uh, continue doing that that smoke with the porters. Uh, even, or even, even, out, even other outside. beers, <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah. So, um, but yeah, man. I mean, this is. I mean, this has been fantastic. Um, you know, I want to thank you for, you know, for allowing us to come here. You know, thank you for the beer. Thank you, you know, for uh, you know for for talking to us. Um, you know, for giving us insight on you know yourself, the brewery, and everything that's going on. Uh, guys, if you aren't already, please go and follow Busted Sendo on all social media, especially Instagram, to keep you know to keep you know uh, up to date with you know what's going on with the tap room um, events. Events, events are going to be coming up. Uh, the One Hundred Club, you know, just you know, uh, you know, yep. it's a fantastic brewery, um, and you know we we can vouch that they actually do put their you know yeah, put in the work themselves. One one thing that I like about here too, and uh, the, the 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 guys uh, from Busted Sendo have always mentioned is that you always walk in a stranger. But you always walk out as family. Yeah, absolutely. Yep. yep. And with that being said, uh, you know, we uh, you know we do here uh, uh, want to give you. We have more of them, but but we want to give you these koozies uh, awesome. for you and the guys. Um, Thank you, know, you. You know for you know for our podcast. Um, Appreciate that. And you know you know once again we're sitting down with uh, with president and co-founder Mike DeChico. Yep. Mike DeChico of uh, Busted Sando. Uh, check out their beers. Check out you know their brewery, their ta their new tap room coming up coming real soon. Um, like I said, Twitter, Instagram, Facebook. Also follow us on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook. Absolutely. Just search Geeky Drinking. Um, and this has been a great episode. 
thank you so much for having us. And, um, you know, we look forward to everything that comes in the future. All right. Cheers, guys. Cheers. 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 All right.